Hi, everyone. Welcome and shalom to you today. Shalom, shalom in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus. Receive nothing missing, nothing broken, peace from God, perfect peace that passes all understanding. Father, we give you glory today and honor and praise that the name of Jesus, that name that is above every name, that name at which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, at that name, we come in that name today. The name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the King and Creator of the universe, we worship and adore you today. We thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you guide and direct us and lead us. Thank you for your love that shed abroad in our heart. We thank you. Lord, stir us up today. I'm asking you to stir us up in the name of Jesus. We praise you for it. We praise you for it. We magnify you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Once again, we welcome you to the study of the Word of God. God's Word, the entrance of His Word, brings light. We're excited about that word today. We're so thankful for it. Paul told Timothy, stir up, stir up the gift that's in you. Well, he had a gift in it being a calling, but you know the gift, the, the gift of all that God has given to his people is his very own faith. And we have to stir up that faith. Our uh, series that we're studying right now has to do with the maintenance or maintaining our faith. And uh, today, I believe the Lord wants to stir us up. Sometimes believers get so formal, even worse than formal, they become casual with the Lord, you know. Oh, yeah, uh, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to be a Christian, ha, ha. But you know what? There ought to be more to it than that. We ought to be excited about what we have. It used to be, a, I just remembered an old song that just came to me. Get all excited. Go and tell everybody that Jesus Christ is Lord. Get all excited. Get all excited. It's time to get excited. But you know, uh, there probably was a time in your faith that excited you. Uh, if it hasn't been that way, then it's time for it to happen. You need to be excited about the things of God. You need to get excited and stay excited about what he's done for us. And we're just going to talk about that a little bit today, about staying excited. But you know, the fact is, to stay excited, you need to stir yourself up in your most holy faith. You need to stir yourself up. In Jude, it says, praying in the Holy Ghost. We edify, we build ourselves up, we stir ourselves up praying in the Spirit. We talked a lot about that recently. But, you know, there are just so many things that God has given us. And one of them is to take a look at his word and read it with understanding. Hear it with understanding. See it with some understanding of what he's saying. I mean, there are some exciting things going on. Exciting things going on in the world today. But, you know, before they came about in the world... They were in God's word. Jesus spoke them. Amen? He spoke them. And we remember that we walk by faith and not by sight. As it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith. We walk by faith. Say it with me. It says, I, say, I walk by faith, walk by faith. Not, by not by sight. Now, that's, a, that's not only a, uh, a confession, but it's also... A direction setter. It's a confession, but you know, when you confess something in the Word of God this way, then we need to start putting it into action. Because there are a lot of us, at one time or another, what we see is what does us in. I used to say sometimes hospital visits are difficulty because of what you see when you go into a... Uh, a person who's very sick or been in an accident 
And the problem is sometimes your sight tries to take over. Sometimes the hearing of your natural ears tries to take over. We could say we walk by faith and not by our senses. Because sight is certainly one of our senses. But, you know, there are other senses that can cause you to get out of faith and into fear. And we need to be firm in this, this scripture. It's so important. And we need to remember that without faith, it's impossible to please him. And we just did a devotion this morning that says when fear comes in, faith goes out. And that's a fact. So we need to guard against fear. And the reason we do is because we please him with our faith, our trust. It's impossible to please him. He that comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews 11.6. Then we, we just have to go back just a little bit and remember the things we've talked about. We kind of started out talking about Abraham, who God instructed, I used to like to say, God said, uh, go someplace and I'll show you where it is when you get there. I'll show you you've arrived when you get there. You know, it, it was very inexact directions. Just leave where you are and come to the place I will show you. And Abraham believed God, the Bible says. Abraham believed God. In fact, in Romans 4, 3, it talks about what happened in Genesis chapter 12 and Genesis chapter 15. The scripture was actually where this comes from. For what saith the scripture? The scripture is Genesis 15. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. That's why faith... And faith is the noun for the verb believe. When you have faith, you believe. A one with faith, faith that's just a, just a noun doesn't do anything. It has to be put into action. Faith in action is believing or trusting. Abraham trusted God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It wasn't because Abraham was perfect. Obviously, he wasn't perfect. We can read about the mistakes he made. We can read about the uh, false attitudes he had, the wrong attitudes, the fearful attitudes that he had. But he did believe God, and you know what? It was counted to him or imputed unto him as righteousness. Righteousness. And we talked about this, that we want to be the same way. Each of us needs to be this way, have that same layer of faith. In fact, in in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 12, it says that you don't be slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. And we talked about that, that we need to be the same way Abraham was, but we need to recognize that Abraham didn't get what he got in a day. In fact, from the time God told Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldees and go to the place he would show him, it was another 24 years before the promise that God had given to him about, I will make of you a great nation, even began to come to pass. A great nation. 24 years. So it took patience. It took patience. And God had different things he had to do. He had to remind him. One of the best and most exciting things that happened to him was that his name, which was originally Avram, exalted father. That's what that uh, that Hebrew term translates to. Avram, exalted father, was changed by God with the insertion of one Hebrew letter. One Hebrew letter was added, even though when we look at it, we say, well, there was more to it than that. No, God didn't add the vowels. He added a Hebrew letter, and that was a hey. And that hey, I like to say, is the breath of God. It's part of God's name, yod Hey, vav Hey. That's the way his name is spelled, yod Hey, yod Hey, vav Hey. 
And he inserted that letter into Avram, and it became Avraham. Avraham, father of many nations. God gave Abram a new confession. And it was a confession of faith, and he couldn't even say his name without confessing, glad to meet you, I'm the father of many nations. And he needed that, and when he changed his name, it wasn't very long afterward that Avram had Yitzhak, Isaac. His son was born, the beginning of the sons of promise. Amen. Amen. So we found out we have to be patient. We have to be patient to receive the promises, but just because we have to be patient to receive them doesn't mean that God is slow. Don't ever say, oh, I don't know why God's taken so long. You know, I hear people do that about, his, uh, about the rapture. What, what's taken you so long? Actually, you know, if we probably will learn the truth one day, that we're the ones that slowed things down. The unbelief within the covenant people has slowed things down, just like it slowed the children of Israel down from entering the promised land. There was a slowness in them to believe. They didn't mix the word that they had received from God with faith, and they slowed it down, and I believe we're going to find out one day that that's exactly why things haven't happened yet today, because, let's just say it the way it is, the church hasn't been believing God the way they're equipped to believe. And I'm talking to you right now, because you're part of the church. You're part of the church. You need to start believing. You need to trust in every way. You need to do that. Your patience needs to go to work also. And then we also discovered that there's something about faith that we have to know. And just the last part of that says faith works by love. Faith, faith works by love. It doesn't work by keeping rules. It doesn't work by uh, obedience of the flesh, but it works by love, and God has shed his love abroad in us. We studied that. We've looked at that. You can go back and listen to these messages and see that. And then we found out something. By a, a question or a request that his apostles gave to him after he had talked to them about how much you need to forgive people, and really what he was teaching was you just need to walk in forgiveness all the time. Even before something has been done wrong to you, you need to already be determined that you're, you're in forgiveness. Amen. We need to stay in forgiveness. We need to stay in forgiveness. And the disciples uh, talking with Jesus, uh, hearing him talk about, I didn't say that you forgive someone seven times. I said until 70 times seven or some translations even say from 70 times 77, or 70 times 70, I think is the way out it's translated in some of them. Anyhow, it'd be about 4,900 times if you could count that far, but you know the idea is you're supposed to walk in forgiveness. Stay forgiving. And the disciples, the apostles, looked at him and said, Luke 17, 5, they said, increase our faith. I believe they said it that way. Oh, Lord, increase our faith. What did Jesus say? He didn't say, okay, I'm going to give you the, the seven steps to keeping your faith increased. Didn't say that, did he? What did he say? You know, the short answer, he says, you need to use what you have. He said, if you have the faith, as of a grain of mustard seed, you shall say, to this sycamine tree be plucked up and cast into the sea. He said something similar in Mark 11. He says, whosoever shall say to this mountain. It didn't take much faith to say. Does the next part. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart. You know, there's a lot of people that are immediately ready to doubt what they've said. They doubt their words. They doubt their ability that God put in them. 
And so Jesus didn't say, I'm going to tell you how to increase your faith. Instead, he said, I want to tell you this. You need to use what you have. You need to begin to act on what you know. And this is for you today. You need to act on what you know. If you've been, if you've been praying a long time and you haven't seen the results, it's very easy for you to put that off on and say, well, the Lord hadn't been ready to do it yet. Well, there are times when timing plays a role. I will tell you the scripture teaches that. But there are more times that Christians are not believing in their hearts. Shall not doubt in their hearts, but shall believe that those things which they say, and by the way, that's powerful, you need to keep saying it, shall come to pass, you shall be healed. If you've been waiting for your healing, are you all the time saying, I am healed, or do you say, I am healed, but I have this symptom? You say, well, you know, I do have this symptom. Do you have to talk about it all the time? You give it strength when you talk about your symptoms. Listen, listen to me. You need to begin to have faith in your heart and doubt not. And sometimes when you start talking about symptoms, you open the door to doubt. I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been doing this. I don't care how long you've been praying, but your healing is yours. It will manifest but you've got to hold fast to what you say. Amen? Praise God. Faith works by love, and the Lord tells us that you've got to use what you have. In Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23, we looked a little bit at some of the Proverbs scriptures last week about how important your heart is and about keeping what you already have, keeping and holding fast to what you have. This verse in four, uh, Proverbs 4.23 ends that section. Keep thy heart. Guard your heart. Listen to me now. Keeping means to guard. It means to guard. It means to watch over. Nasar. To watch over your heart with all diligence. Watch over it. Keep it close. Keep it close and then keep it closed to unbelief. Amen. Guard it from unbelief. Unbelief is what puts people down always. It's what defeats. Unbelief is the defeater. You don't have to say, yeah, but I don't know. I, it just always keeps coming up. Of course it does. That's the devil's job. He does that all the time. Wants to make you get back into it. Wants you to say something negative. How are you doing today? Not very good. What did you just say? You just set in motion what you don't want. The Bible says to speak those things you do want. Speak those things that the Bible says you should believe. How are you doing today? Stop. Sometimes you may have to grit your teeth, but say, I am the healed of God. I'm walking in victory today. No matter the circumstances, I continue to walk in victory. No matter what I feel, no matter what I see, I'm the healed of God. Don't say not very good. You just gave the devil permission to keep pouring it on. You need to stop it. Listen to me now. It's important that you do it that way. Amen. Now today, I want to I wanna just get into a little bit different area. I think we've talked a little bit about it, but... How can you tell you're walking in faith? How can you tell that you're walking in faith? Someone said this the other day. I heard him say it. And I thought at the time, you know, I hadn't thought about it just this way, but it's oh so true. Keep thy heart. With all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Well, how can I guard my heart? How can I guard my heart? I can choose things. I can choose things to look at. And when this person said this, I began to think about it. I began to think about this. You can tell about my faith by how excited I am about it. 
You know, there's some people can talk the same words that another person does, but when they say it, it's just like it's words that are droning. It doesn't have any accent. It doesn't have any life in it. But I'll tell you what, and we'll teach you right on this scripture here. We'll teach you right on this scripture. What are you excited about? What are you excited about? Well, let me show you a scripture you ought to be excited about. For all the promises of God. You say, where are those promises? Listen, there are so many promises in this book that a lot of people have said to go ahead and set them down in printed form, but they're in here. They're in here. And the thing is, you know, even when you've got a need, sometimes you can't think of the promise. But you know who can? The one who promised. And this is why, and this is that whole teaching that we're doing, and we've been doing for so long, is that God wants you to be led by His Spirit. God wants you to be led by His Spirit because all of the promises of God in Him and that's talking about in Christ, in Jesus, in the Anointed One, are yea, King James' word for yes. They're yes. And in Him, all men. Well, believe it or not, that's a Hebrew word also. Hebrew word, all men. It wasn't even, they didn't even try to translate it into, into Greek when they wrote the Newer Covenant in Greek. They didn't even try to do it. But every promise of God is yes. Now, you, gotta, you want to get excited about this, think about this. Every time you have a need and you ask God to meet that need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus... Every time you have a need and you confess that my need is supplied according to God's riches and glory by Christ Jesus, the answer is what? Yes. The answer is yes. Every time a sick person comes to the Lord and presents himself to God as one who needs healing, one who is in need of healing, the answer is, I will heal all of their sicknesses. That's a promise. And it's a yes. Why? Because you're praying according to his will. You're asking according to his will. He's told us his will. I sent my word to heal them. That's what God said. He sent his word to heal us. His word is Jesus. He sent his word to heal us. And there's no place where it ever says some of their diseases. Does it? No, he heals all of their diseases. All of them. So the promise of God is, yes, yes. Oh, but sometimes, don't you think he says, wait? No, I don't find that any place. In fact, even if you don't receive instantaneously, the answer is not wait. The answer is yes. And in him, in Jesus, the answer is all the promises are amen. Amen. And it means they're true. Every promise of God is true. It's not half true, it's all true. It's completely true, and it's under the glory of God by us. Now, if you'll take time to meditate that and begin to apply it into your life, even before you see answers, you can get excited about that. I mean, what an exciting scripture. What an exciting verse. All the promises of God in him are yea, and in him all men under the glory of God by us. By us? What's that mean? By us. How come they're by us? It glorifies God when you believe, when you trust, 
when he works this promise through you. When you ask, what does the Bible say? You have not because you ask not. You know, there's some people actually kind of gun shy about asking. You want to know why? Because they think God's like a man. They think God's like a man that sometimes he says yes and sometimes he said no. But he just told us here he always says yes when you're talking about his promises. Always said yes. Well, I don't know his promises. Man, they're available. You begin to ask the Holy Spirit, show me the promise I need for this. In fact, some of you that have been praying for a long time and you've been applying the promises you've come up with, just stop today and say, Lord, maybe I haven't asked you to show me the promise that I need to be asking you to fulfill. Maybe I haven't really believed for the ones I've come up with, but you show me and I'll believe it. I'll trust you and God will give you new promises. New promises. New ways to believe. Hey, I tell you, this is exciting. Say it's exciting. It's exciting, amen? Listen to this. Listen to, listen to how exciting God's word. The law of the Lord, this is not law as we think of law, this is actually the Torah, the Torah of the Lord. The instructions of the Lord are perfect. That's what the law is. The Torah is perfect. You know what perfect is? It's the same thing as nothing missing, nothing broken. It's the same thing as whole and complete. Amen. The law of the Lord is perfect, and it converts the soul Somebody said, oh, but I've already gotten converted. No, you haven't. Your spirit has been saved, but your soul is being converted right now. Hearing these words can help to convert your soul. Our soul is being saved by receiving with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save the soul. So that's why you need to keep getting this word in. It'll convert your natural thinking your mind, your will, your emotions, your imagination. Amen. The testimony, what God's Word says about itself, the testimony of the Lord is sure. It's certain. Is that a yes? Yes, it's certain. Making wise the simple. You know what? There's so many educated people today that aren't wise at all. So many educated people because they've been educated in the wrong way. But God wants to take people, though they may not be considered qualified by the world's standard, He makes them wise. He makes wise the simple. You say, are you simple? Yes, I believe I am. I'm simple. And I want to stay simple. I want to stay simple when it comes to the things of God. I don't want to always have a hidden agenda. And I don't believe God has hidden agendas. He makes us wise. He makes wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. Listen, when I see the things that God has said, His immense wisdom in everything, in the way He does things, in the way He applies His word, it rejoices my heart. And listen, if you haven't realized this, when you start to rejoice, you're starting to get excited. You need to stay excited, but you need to rejoice your heart with the statutes of the Lord. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. There's nothing like having the light come on. Well, that's exciting when the light comes on. I get so excited when the Lord shows me something new. You know, it's exciting just to know He cares so much that He doesn't want us to go along with our own ways. He wants us to move on into that which is good. The law of the Lord is perfect, it says. The statutes of the Lord are right. The fear of the Lord, the awe, listen, the awe of the Lord. You know, something that we can have for God that can be translated as fear, the reason it's not the same kind of fear because it's clean. <laughs> <laughs> the fear of the Lord is clean. You know, the fear of just natural fear is dirty. But the fear of the Lord, the awesome God that we serve, that's a clean fear. 
and it endures forever. Listen, when I just start to talk about forever, I get excited. Uh, you know, as a child, I remember uh, struggling with forever. Struggling with forever. Uh, you know, I didn't realize that everything I knew had time and space, but the things of the Lord, there's no time involved. They're forever, and they go on and on and on. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. And here you get it. Listen to this. More to be desired are they than gold. I don't know what you would do if, if somebody pulled up in front of your house with a truckload of gold. What would you do? Hmm? I mean, I guess you probably, you know, naturally might start asking some questions what's going on, but... If you were convinced that this gold belonged to you, you tell me you wouldn't be excited. You know, in all of the years that have gone on since creation, you know, way back in Genesis, we find out that gold is good. In Revelation, we find out that it's used for pavement in heaven. But here on this earth, gold is the standard I know there's platinum and other precious metals now that are valuable. I recognize that, but there's still a standard, gold. gold. More to be desired are what than gold? What's more to be desired? The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. And then you put all of those things we just discovered about God's Word. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, than much fine gold. What is fine gold? Pure. Pure gold. Assayed with purity. Sweeter. Say sweeter. Sweeter also than the honey and the honeycomb. There again, you've got a standard of things that are, of, of anything that's sweet. The honey standard is the standard. It really is. Uh, the older I get, the more I like honey. I remember my granddad used to always have honey around. Always had honey. Buy them big, big jars from a beekeeper. And he always had honey. And I took it. I liked it. It was good. I enjoyed it. But you know, lately, what I've discovered about honey doesn't take much to really cause enjoyment to a biscuit. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. You know what? Simple things can become very exciting. How much more the wonderful things that these are describing in the Lord, the Word of God, the Word of God. Exciting. I want to stay excited. The psalmist knew something about staying excited. You know, listen to what, what the psalmist says in Psalm 31, 19. Now, you can read this like this. Well, how great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. I listen to some preachers reading the word, and I think, what are they doing? You know, we don't, we don't have to stop and read every word real slowly, but, you know, why read it if you're just going to sound like a robot? How about the psalmist? What was he saying? You know, he was probably singing this. Oh, how great is thy goodness which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee. Probably sounded a lot better than that. But I want you to think about it. Oh, how great is thy goodness which thou hast laid up for them, me, that fear you, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in you. Before the sons of men. I trust in God before the sons of men. You know what I'm getting right now? I'm getting a tingle all over. Just talking about it. I'm excited. Are you excited? You need to be excited about the things of God. Oh, how great. I love it when, when the word starts with an oh. <laughs> I, I think there's something about that. The psalmist got that. Oh, how great is thy goodness which thou hast laid up for them the fear. 
Oh, it's great for me because I trust in you before the sons of men. I, I let people know I trust in you, God. I trust in you, my God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul did the same thing. Paul did the same thing in Romans eleven thirty three. The Lord, speaking through Paul, infuses him with his very own excitement. Do you know God's excited about his word? You know why? Because of what it does for the people. But listen to how Paul put this out by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaking to him. Romans chapter 11, he says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgment and his ways past finding out. How many of you think he was excited? I believe he was excited when he said that. <laughs> you don't generally start something out with, Oh, unless you going to follow it up with something pretty good. Amen. Oh, oh. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, this is shown throughout Scripture that sometimes people who are receiving things from the Lord are excited about Jesus. You know, nobody knows exactly the steps that it takes to get from sick to healed. But God does. And I'm excited that he knows exactly how to lead me along that way. And I was reading just, just this week, I was reading about a man called Bar Timaeus. That is a man who, who Bar means son, son of Timaeus. And if you don't remember Bar Timaeus, you can find out about him in Mark chapter 10, toward the end of that uh, book, or that chapter, Jesus and his disciples had been to Jericho. They were leaving Jericho. And on the way out of Jericho, the people were letting him know they weren't really ready for him to go. They lined up along the roads. Amen. And Bartimaeus had had somebody lead him out there, possibly, possibly, because it was a good begging place to get among big crowds. When people get excited and when they're joyful, they're apt to be more generous. And it's possible that's the reason he went out there, because of the crowd. But suddenly, it was told him who was coming. Who was coming. And Mark 10, verse 47 and I, I don't know that I've ever seen this quite this way before. I think before I've always seen this with, a, with a, a note of desperation. I don't think there was desperation, no. It said, when he heard, Mark 10, 47, when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth. Here's this blind man. Who knows, maybe, he, maybe the crowd came out where he already was. I don't know. But he was there. I've heard sermons about the fact that beggars in that day wore a beggar's coat. It, it identified him. He was blind. He was blind. Bartimaeus was blind. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out. He began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. How many of you believe he did that? No, you don't believe that at all. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. What was he showing? Well, he was showing faith that Jesus could do that, but you know what? He was excited about his faith. He was excited about it. He'd heard what Jesus had done. I'm sure he'd heard that blind eyes had been opened. People all around Israel were getting word of this. Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me. Now religious people do not like that. Even some born-again people, they get so staid. Oh, you know, you can ask in a proper manner. You don't have to get so excited about things. No, get excited. 
get excited. Many charged him. All the people around him, many of them said, hold your peace. They got excited about that. They told him, shh, Jesus is coming by. Don't you know this is a religious moment? But what did he do? He cried the more. In other words, if he was loud the first time, he cried the more. If he did it several times the first time, he did it more the next time. He cried the more a great deal. Oh, King James got a wonderful way of putting that. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. Can you see him? He wasn't sitting there. He was waving his hands, and Jesus stopped. And Jesus stopped and said, bring him to me. Bring him to me. Bring him to me. What do you suppose happened to this excited man? He got more excited. Why is that? Because Jesus opened his eyes. Jesus opened his eyes and he saw. I don't know if it was the first time he had ever seen or not, but he saw. His eyes were opened. Bartimaeus went around. Do you think he was excited? He was excited. His excitement had given birth to more excitement. And you can do the same thing. Listen, every time you see a prayer answered, get excited about it. It, it may look, you know, you can get to thinking, well, that's just what God does. He answers prayer, Ta 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 ta. No, no. God answered another prayer. God's showing himself mighty again. Excitement. Stay excited. Look at your neighbor and say it. Stay excited. Stay excited. Father, we love you. We give you glory and honor and praise. Get all excited. Go and tell someone that Jesus Christ is Lord. We, we remember that song, and we know that its message is pure and true. We need to be excited saints. Saints that, saints that are getting ready for heaven. Amen? Saints that are ready. The next time I talk to them, Lord, I want to talk to them about heaven. Oh, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.